All right. Um, it's eight minutes after, so we'll. Hey, uh, do we have Matt? We have Matt. Matt's here. Hey, Matt. Hey guys, sorry, I'm finishing making breakfast. I also, um, uh, I don't know if you guys had issues uh, finding the link to the stand up, but I we we I, we still need to figure. It. Derek and I have like an internal meeting invite for the stand up when we originally started it, and it still has the old Juniper Networks link. So I had to go to the forums to find it, but the forums I don't think are working right this morning. I keep going to it from many different computers, and it's like not loading at all. I wonder if they're taking it out. Yeah, the forums seem to be down right now. I can't get to them either. What? It took me a while to find. <laughs> That's why it took okay. me a time to join. That's, Sorry about that. It's working perfect for me. Yeah, I, I tried to. I tried to open. I tried to open it uh, to get into the stand of it. Just literally wouldn't load at all. Um, you... I think I loaded one page, but it was the home page. And then when I tried to click on weekly stand up to get to the specific topic, it wouldn't load at all. Wow, that's weird. Yeah, it's working great for me. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Pretty slow here. Maybe there's an maybe there's an outage in the internets. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm gonna bring up the uh, the agenda. And that's the other thing I wanted to do. I can't I can't see because I can't look at it. I wrote the agenda last night, but then I couldn't get to it this morning, so I don't remember what the agenda is. All right. Uh, so somebody wants to take notes, that'd be good. Anyone? Anyone? I will when I get upstairs, but I won't be for like a minute or two. Okay, we'll wait for... Actually, these are all items that, that you... Positive. So I, I don't have any agenda items right now. Um, you know, other. Uh, yeah, you're going to speak to everything I wanted to even talk about anyway. So just that, you know, I'm going to throw something out there and I'll start. I don't remember what I put there. I remember. Uh, just, we were just talking about MP3 anyway. I was saying, um, you know, we. We really got to get around to MP3. The the biggest, most laborious thing about doing contributions is when you have to make your own image, yeah. and um, it shouldn't be as that laborious, but it is. And we should definitely uh, work on eliminating or making that easy. And most of it, when it, once you build an image, you realize a lot of it can be automated. Um, so we need we really need to to do that right so that. It's like, it's like prescriptive, you know, you can say, here's a list of tip packages, here's a list of um, other packages, and then if you, you can choose Debian or CentOS, and then it'll just, it'll auto build the kernel, it'll install those packages, potentially, you can run a, a bash script on it, you know. To, can, can someone mute Matt, please? Yeah, Matt, oh, I'm sorry. You. I'm sorry, I'm walking upstairs. Okay, thank you. Uh, so that, you know, it, it, you get a custom build kernel that's VertIO only, right? We eliminate all those unnecessary drivers. Um, so it's nice and tiny. Then we, um, then it, it installs whatever packages, makes whatever, you know, user additions it has to make, group, group additions, stuff like that. You know, it should, and then <clears throat> installs, like I said, any pip, yum, APT packages, and then finally, it's, you know, some shell scripts or whatever, um, or static files that you want to copy over um, and potentially execute or config files, static config files. And it should be, you should be able to specify that like in some kind of format and then just have it build the kernel and build the image without you having to manually do it um, or having to write Docker files or whatever. You know, you should just be able to prescriptively do those things. And <clears throat> that's what MP3 is going to be. That's what it's going to specify. And then when you have to make your own image, like with some kind of appliance, let's say Netbox or the Asterisk PBX that we have now, um, you, you can, it, it won't be a, it just won't be as laborious. Getting Ansible Tower, because I don't know anything about Red Hat, right? Doing it by hand from scratch um, is, is just, it's taking up way more time than it should have. 
Um, that's what MP3 is about. So um, I don't know if anyone here has the experience building custom kernels, um, but there's a good starting point. There's a project called Firecracker out there and their, their whole thing is what they call micro VMs, which is, it's, it's so basically um, instead of, what they do is they launch, uh, Firecracker is like a cloud, cloudy type platform, right? And it's container based, but what's interesting is that um, your applications do not reside in the actual containers. What happens is it launches a container, then within that container, it launches a virtual machine. But that virtual machine is very, very tiny. It's, and they call it a micro VM. And the way they accomplish that is um, they, they have, um, they, they very meticulously went through the kernel config file, um, like for, for, you know, um, whatever you call that standard, the standard kernel and uh, eliminated like 90% of that kernel file. And it was, like I said before, they, there was, there's all kinds of stuff in there, like PC MCIA drivers and audio drivers for 10,000 audio pieces of hardware and um, graphics tablets. And there's all together when they, they, they went from a three gig minimum Debian build to 150 meg Debian build by just eliminating unnecessary SCSI drivers and RAID drivers and just like, uh, just all, of course graphics drivers like all kinds of things so uh, anyway um, that's so we're I'm thinking we're going to use that as the baseline there are some things we have to add back in um, to that custom kernel config they disable a lot of networking stuff and this is a network automation learning platform so we kind of don't want to do that but um, it shouldn't be more than 175 200 meg um, with, with the base build. And, and, and what's interesting is that um, with all of that stuff eliminated, uh, this kind of blows my mind, the, um, the, the kernel only occupies 30 megs of RAM, which is pretty incredible. And the boot time is instantaneous. It's one eighth of a second to get to a login prompt. So we sh should be aiming to do that um, with, with our images. And that's, I imagine that'll be the difficult part of MP3 is getting um, is getting a kernel build that makes sense, and then actually turning that, taking that kernel image and then turning it into a Debian or CentOS um, uh, Linux box, which, which uh, Debian and Linux, Debian and CentOS both have bootstrapping tools that allow you to do that. So you can compile the kernel to a, like um, to some directory, let's say you know target slash whatever. And then um, you can troot to that directory, C-H-R-O-O-T, and that basically um, tricks the system into thinking that that, or that you, whatever you're running with the troot command, it tricks it into thinking that that um, directory is root. And then you can run this thing called dev bootstrap um, inside of that troot and it turns, it'll, it'll make all the directories and basically create um, as if that's the root of a Debian build. And then, uh, and then you can turn that into a bootable image. So <clears throat> that's, that's effectively what we'll have to do with MP3. And as soon as this Ansible Tower image is done, I have to focus on MP3 and we have to automate this, the whole process, like I said, so that it's, um, it's a lot simpler and people can build curriculum easier. Derek? Yes. Uh, have you had a chance to have a look at the Kubevert uh, image build process? Because I think uh, the whole point um, of Kubevert looks like doing what you described, more or less. Yeah, well, that's what Firecracker is. Firecracker computes yeah, Kubevert. It's... So I, I can, I'll look at it. I mean, they, we're going to start with their, with their build, with their kernel config. And, um, and see, maybe they have tools um, to build those VMs that we can steal. That would be pretty awesome, the, actually. The, the idea is maybe that uh, also it deals with uh, distributing the images uh, so that uh, they're available for pulling later and so on. So it's a kind of a standard way to uh, have a, a workflow of uh, building and uh, distributing and pulling. Um, so I'm not sure if there are any drawbacks performance wise, but uh, at least in terms of uh, standardization of the workflow and uh, being able to reuse maybe other images and, uh, and customize more. Um, 
I would tend to rely on an existing project, but maybe uh, that's not the, the best way because maybe uh, that's not the purpose. Uh, maybe they disabled too many networking uh, options, so that wouldn't work for a very lapse. But I guess avoiding to reinvent the wheel somehow would be my advice. Well, what I would recommend is that we, very similar to what we're doing with all the other mini projects, what, um, what MP3 needs is, you know, its own design doc that's to, that, that talks about all the options in the open, lists them side by side, provide pros and cons and all of that. Um, so we have it all in one place and then we can make a logical decision on, on which one we want to go with. Like in my head, the last time I looked at Qbert, which is probably months ago, it seemed like it wasn't actually dealing with much of the images stuff and much more on just like the runtime options of like starting and pausing and stopping VMs, which mm -hmm. we don't really need because we don't care about stopping VMs. We just kill the Kubernetes pod. That's fine. But maybe ha maybe it's changed. And, I, and, and it's all speculation, honestly, until it's written down. Like, mm -hmm. like we, we got to have it written down in one place. That way everybody can comment on it and we can have a snapshot view of like what the what the different options are, and then we as a community can just choose, yep, this is the way we want to go because it gets us the, you know, best payoff. Yeah. Well, so you, I would I, say that, sorry. Well, I didn't to to make experiments and so <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's got to be the first step is to, is to get a design doc published, even in a draft form. Well, actually, especially in a draft form. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and say, though, that we will do micro VMs. <laughs> that's going to be the outcome. Um, just because it's, they boot faster, they consume way less resources, um, and we get w way more, way more out of the resources that we're paying for in the cloud when mm -hmm. we have very tiny images, and that's what we're going to do. Um, we just have to have a way of building them. And by the way, um, that build process needs to be automated and it needs to be repeatable so that um, whether it's nightly or weekly, we're automatically building the images over and over again. Mm -hmm. That's and That's it should be mean. done under uh, in a container to be doable inside a container. So you wouldn't require to have a, access to a physical machine, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we have, that, that's, that, that part's actually, I think, the most exciting part about this because everything outside of what Derek's talking about is already automated. So like if you, if you um, look at the images that are, that are currently being used, they have make files and they have to support that make Docker thing. This is all in the docs. So that, that part's automated and that runs nightly. So all that's needed is for the sort of in, intra image automation stuff to get done and hooked up to that make Docker step. And if you can do that, then like literally everything is automated and, that, and that's exciting. In the same way that it, I mean, we, we do have that actually today, but it's all with Docker images with no VM layer at all, which has the, the trade-offs that I'm sure Derek, Derek talked about at the beginning. You know, we have to basically grant them privilege mode, which is which doesn't make me feel good. <laughs> well, Dad, and it's just a matter of time before there's a break, right? I mean, there's more, there's a vulnerability that we're going to be exposed to, and I and it, having everything inside of a VM it adds one more layer of ob obfuscation, really. So um, yeah. that it, that helps, right? Cool. So yeah, I I took notes on that. I basically um, said, yeah, we're. You know, we're going to follow the lead of the Firecracker project, which is to create a common micro VM base, which is very stripped down, and then automate the installation of packages on top of that. And um, we'll, uh, the, the first step is to create a draft sort of design doc that talks about the options and allows people to, to see at least what, you know, tangibly what we're going to be doing and see what the options are. Okay. So that's MP3 um, in a nutshell. And I'll... Uh, I'll tell you what, um, over Olivier, if uh, you have time, why don't you document if there is a Qvert image process or recommended one um, for Qvert? I don't, I didn't see any guidance from them either on how to build the images. Um, I know that there is recommendations to do a micro VM kind of thing with, with you're going to run Qvert, but if you find that, please, um, there's an MP3 placeholder now inside of the. Uh, and one of them the, in that, oh my gosh, in that repository. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to look it up so I can get a link. Yeah, uh, please document Seven. in there. Um, I, I'm gonna, regardless of that process or, or regardless of whatever process uh, Fire Firecracker recommends, I'm probably gonna go through figuring out how to build, do it by hand anyways, so that I know what we have to do to do it right and 
and and then we'll see if those tools will will, will match what we need to do. Um, I just sent the link uh, into chat, Olivier, if you want to take a peek at that. Also, uh, we have someone new, Slimfire. Yes, hello. How you doing? Good, how are you? Doing all right. Are you, do you go by Slim? Or... <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, my name is Johannes. Uh, I'm, I'm a student. I, I, I looked through the repositories and just wanted to be involved. And yeah, I just joined the, the meeting. Sweet, student of? Uh, Fishburg State in, in Massachusetts. Oh, nice. Yep, nice. yep. Cool, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining the call. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Um, the uh, the forums are still down, dude. Can can you just <laughs> read the? You apparently have the golden internet connection, dude. It, it's working. I, I every time I hit reload, it, it comes back instantly. So I don't know what the deal is. I'm um, looking at uh, multiple computers and multiple networks. It's down. It's weird. Yeah, I don't can know. You just read the items to me. Sure, I'll just. Oh my gosh, I got a sliver. <laughs> uh, antidote MP1. Well, actually, let's do the let's do the um, let's do the other thing first, dude. Opportunities for improvement in NRE Labs curriculum and self medicate. Yeah, so I saw some folks responded to this, which is awesome. Um, I did not see what you said uh, because I can't. I can't. Um, Here, let me let me read what the responses are. Okay. From Stephen, who is on the line actually right now, he says, "Thank you for taking the time to put this together." Yeah, and I wanted then, to add more, but I couldn't get in into words yet. So I wanted to post something to let you know it was read. Um, yep, yeah, and Olivier, um, similar sentiments. So thank you for for posting it. Okay. Uh, um, do you want me to go through this then, Matt? Oh no, you don't have to read it now. I, I, more. We don't even have really have to discuss it. I think it. I think everything's contained there. Um, if if everybody wants to sort of like digest that over the next week, that's fine too. Um, the big thing for me is like, to be honest, I I view self medicate as as extremely important to the health of the project at the moment. I just want to reiterate that. Um, uh, because yeah. one of our biggest one of our biggest problems is that we we have there's a lot to do and we just need bodies, um, you know. And we all all of us actually, um, even 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 Derek and I, although this changes from time to time, but even Derek and I have jobs that that uh, that have responsibilities outside of NRE Labs, and of course that's true for everybody else. Um, and so, you know, it, um, it there's just a lot to do. And the one thing that we that we can't have is any barriers to getting more folks involved in in the project. And I think the current state of self medicate need, the current state of self medicate is is sort of very transitory. Like we we started with something that like was functional that had a lot of problems, but it was functional. And so in order to solve those problems, we started looking at ways to solve them, which is awesome. Um, but then we effectively made it non functional, not for everybody. It's not like totally broken, I don't think. But for a, it seems like every time like uh, you know Derek gets on the phone with like say Red Hat, I know he's been talking about that a lot. Um, you know, we, we've been we've been working with Red Hat for Ansible content, Packet Pushers as well. There's just been struggles. So I would say like if 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 we can if we can rally around that, if 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 we can have, you know, sort of somebody step up and say like, look, here's the plan for how we want self medicate to work right now. Here's what it'll support. Here's how it'll work. Here's what kind of projects it'll use, and here's why. And then we all rally around that. I think that'll that'll be very meaningful. But that doesn't have to get solved today. I don't think. I, I think this is one of those things where it's actually worth uh, taking a little slow and thinking thinking meaningfully about what needs to be done. So we can circle back next week. I think, and and that's that's totally fine. But I wanted to, like I said, I when I when I was on the road like three weeks for the last three weeks, uh, you know, it's it is it is tough for me because I also I also see like a lot of activity on the repo, which is awesome, and like, you know, I, I think it's good that there is activity. Um, but I just, I want I think, I think it needs to be a little bit more, um, I think a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, coordinated towards a, towards a common purpose. And that, that purpose is stability of self-medicate. Cause I just want to highlight not, not, and like I said, at the beginning of that post, I don't think it's actually all that bad. I don't think it'll take a lot of work to do that. I think the thing I wanted to highlight was that self-medicate for us and that, and I have other plans to make this less true, 
but um, self-medicate for us is kind of a make or break project. Like if that, if that's not working, then we don't get to, we don't get to play with any of our other toys <laughs> effectively. Yeah. And it is a barrier. Um, that, and what he's referring to is um, pack up. There's a networking news site um, like podcasts and blogs and, and all kinds of media actually called packet pushers. And it's all networking all the time and networking in the cloud, networking, WAN, LAN, whatever. If packets are moving, that's they're going to talk about it and cover it. Um, and they want to partner with us. And um, I had, <laughs> when I started working with them, Vagrant, we, we had a Vagrant file, but then we had alternate ways to start the, the, the environment. And um, in, in between the first and second time I was working with them to get them set up, um, the first time was just them setting up a server. They, they just hadn't really done that in forever. And I sort of walked them through setting up an Ubuntu server. The second time though, <clears throat> we had the script that we were using um, to start it was gone. So I said, okay, it's Vagrant. So um, you're Intel and you're on Linux. And uh, we just ran into issues. Like, and I, and I we cannot use Vagrant. Um, on Intel and Linux, it just, it's it, like, if there's three nodes in a lesson, if there's two nodes in a lesson, it becomes unusably slow. Like it just slow. And I have a beefy box. So, um, and then getting Libvirt installed, Libvirt is no longer by default supported with Vagrant. And uh, there's a Vagrant, Libvirt Vagrant plugin. Um, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't always install super easy. Um, there's sometimes if you have other Ruby packages installed, it can interfere with the build process. And um, if you have a vanilla 1804, like Ubuntu box, it, it installs no issues. It'll install with no issues. I didn't, I had a 1904 box and I had Ruby already installed for other projects and um, it would not build. I could not get it to build. Um, and, well, actually, that's not true. I got it to work, but then I destroyed my box in the process and I had to rebuild it. So um, I went and I decided I'm just going to go to LTS um, away from 1904. And then with before I put anything else on the box, it installed just like the directions say it will. Um, but unfortunately, the Ubuntu box that we built for packet pushers, they also could not get it to build or install. So we, we really need to nail that down. Um, a lot of people are going to be using Intel based boxes with Linux. And, and so far, both partners that we're talking to are using Linux with Intel CPUs. So we, we, have, to, we have to have a process for making sure that it runs on, 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 on boxes that, uh, that are gonna be running Linux and Intel. Yeah, I, think, I think, I mean, this is the struggle, right? Like we, like one of the reasons we moved to Vagrant was so that we could support more you know, the, the, the Minikube command by itself, I don't think supported all operating systems very well. I think it worked really well on Linux, but then other, but, other, other operating systems it didn't. Wasn't, so, wasn't there right. the, the original need for Vagrant, the need to modify the ETC host or something like that, which required bash? I think no, they that, that, that right? wasn't the only, uh, that wasn't the only reason, but yeah, Derek's right. Also, uh, we, we don't need to do that anymore because yeah. I experimented with the, uh, the ingress. Did we merge that. those changes into self-medicate? Not yet. We, let's do that. Please. I don't, I'm not sure what those are, but if you guys know what those changes are. So yeah. So like, if you, if you look at the ingress definition for antidote, whether the problem was, or syringe rather, the problem was that, you know, the, in, the default, um, when you what the, 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 the NGINX ingress controller, the default, um, the default backend is antidote web. So that will work no matter what, because that's it, even if there's a problem, that's where it gets routed. So that's why you can always get to the web front end. But um, it, unless you use that antidote local host name, then you would not be able to see any lessons because you couldn't reach syringe. Um, because syringe uses a different path and a different ingress definition. So this so the what I discovered after some experimentation was that you can actually just remove the host, um, the the host um you know, whatever definition declaration in the ingress uh, for, you know, the routing so that you only have the path, which is slash syringe, is it which means, is it the nginx ingress? What is it? Is it the nginx controller YAML file no, in the manifest? No, that would, that would be, it, that's the, that's like the deployment for the controller itself. What you're, what you need to look at is the ingress definition. The ingress um, definition, in which is the syringe. In 
syringe. It's syringe. Ma- yeah, manifests and then syringe cadis dot uh, yaml. And then I think it's like so, the bottom. So if yeah, you apply the change that you suggested, it will work. Antidote dash local. I see. There's a rule that says host. Yep. Right. We can eliminate that. Yeah, you can eliminate that and just put h and start start that line with HTTP, then paths, then you know what I mean. Yeah, I got you. And for the TLS, we can just eliminate host or it's, do no. Isn't there a no host? Isn't there a no host check option? It, it you can remove that entire section because we're not even using TLS. Okay. And then there would be some uh, some change needed on the demo lesson. The, is it the example lesson? How is it called? The what lesson? The, uh, the one what that lesson? starts the Jupyter, the web application. The oh, the, uh, you're talking about inside a syringe. Um, There's a syringe um, hack. Is it in the hack directory? No, no. It's the, the, in the curriculum, uh, there is this demo lesson. Oh, lesson zero. Yeah, that one. Uh, so if you start Jupyter, I think uh, it won't work with the control. So it needs uh, to be adjusted to something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm lost. Where, which, which lesson are you talking about? Are you, is this in the NRE Labs curriculum or in the antidote test curriculum? Mm. Okay, I'm confused now. <laughs> it's been a long time. We don't have any lessons anyway. that use Jupyter. So we, we moved... We moved lesson zero out of Henry Labs curriculum. Ah, uh, it's a, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. It's uh, something else. It's the series J mock. Okay. I'm confused. Yeah. Yep. That's the one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, the... one, that one needs also the catch all? No. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm completely confused. Okay. Forget about it. I would, I would strongly recommend that you not really look too much, too hard at syringe D mock. Um, no. That, I'm literally going to kill. I'm literally going to kill that in a month. Once, yeah, but once, Steve, once uh, we move to database models in MP1, yeah. that's going to die because there's yeah. no need for it. Are you going to get rid of all the mocks then? There will be no need for it because all we all we will need to do at that point, if there's a proper database backending all of this, you can just load whatever content you want into the database, and it'll show that. So there won't be a need for a mock. It'll just the API will show whatever's in the database. Okay. All right. All right, then we just got to make those changes and self-medicate, and then, then we won't need to change the host file. Yeah, but in any case, uh, there was also uh, some change that could be useful. Uh, if you look at the chat, it's uh, issue 54 on self-medicate, where I advocated the, the split of the provisioning scripts in two, one part about uh, Kubernetes and one part about uh, uh, Antidote which would help making sure we can uh, still use a uh, mini cube or kind or another alternative uh, provisioning uh, hypervisor so that uh, we are not bound to the vagrant. Uh, so you've already done this, right? You've already, for your experiments, you've already separated them? Uh, I think I have a branch where, um, no, I, I, w- I was, I wanted to discuss that uh, to, to get your opinions on that, but I have a branch that uh, included a lot of uh, the changes already, the tiny changes I needed for LibreOps and so on. Why don't you open a PR for that? Uh, I could, but uh, the thing is, uh, it's hard to test with, um, uh, Windows uh, with uh, Windows 10 with Hyper-V and so on and Vagrant and, and, and make sure that uh, it's mergeable. You know, there is no automated test here to pass. Well, so this is this goes right back to what Matt was saying about the stability self medicate. Um, you should still open a PR. We don't have automated testing f- to test it on every OS and every CPU. Mm-hmm. So open a PR and before we and then assign. Well, like Stephen runs Windows, right? Windows and yeah. uh, AMD, Correct. isn't that right, Stephen? Uh, Windows Intel. Um, okay, he, he runs Windows yeah. Intel. So um, there's one person, right, who can who could test Windows and Intel. And then, um, you know, I run Linux and Intel. I think, what do you run? Uh, Linux and Intel, too. Linux, okay, what about Johannes, what do you run? Uh, I have uh, just Mac, Mac OS. Like, uh, yeah. 
Okay, so Mac OS and whatever that is, Intel. Well, don't they have their own? Is that a new Mac? Uh, have like Mac Air. I'm Mac not sure. Air. Yeah. I don't know if Mac Air supports virtualization, to be honest. I mean, the thing is not only to, to test. I mean, uh, my, my difficulty here is uh, that it was going a, a bit backwards compared to the move to Vagrant. So I, I, want, I didn't want to be rude to uh, Stephen, for instance, that had worked on Vagrant, which was about merging everything in a single script. So splitting again was some kind of uh, way going backwards. So it's not just about the technical feasibility. It's just like, what is the consensus or what, is there any guidance? I don't think it's or? going backwards, dude. It's not going backwards. I mean, look, the reason why we use Vagrant is because it, it's, it's ostensibly makes it easier to launch self-medicate across OSs and hypervisors and CPUs, right? That's the idea. Um, so, um, it's not backwards to split it. It's backwards would be going back to just having a bash script launch it. That would be backwards. Mm -hmm. um, but splitting out the launching of the VM from, or, or whatever the environment is, and then from the launching of the application, I don't think is going backwards. I think that makes mm -hmm. sense. We should do that. I mean, it allows okay. for better customization, right? Um, yeah, and, and I think it's possible as well. Sorry. Okay. So let's do it. Let's split it out. And, and did you guys before we before we merge it, we'll all test yeah. it, right? Okay. And did you guys have a look at the kind uh, way? Um, I went to the wet. I think that's very interesting. I like it, and I'm inclined to say it. We should do that um, for people who are. I think for people who are running Linux and Intel. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the Max. And also maybe about uh, Docker for Windows, because I, I made a few tests. It seemed to be working on Windows, but I don't have the expertise to to truly uh, test or tune or. Yeah, I think it's okay to have yeah. multiple options. I think we should have a standard way of doing it. Um, I'm, I'm okay with leaving the script that Stephen made as as the default standard way. Um, a lot of open source projects have a tools or user scripts directory where people contribute um, other ways of doing things with the pro inside the project or helpful tools um, for their different environments. Uh, it, 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 in fact, I think that would probably, Matt, what do you think about that? I think that's a good idea. We can make like a tools directory um, and, and inside that tools directory, we can have Olivier, right? Uh, uh, an Overjix directory and then with some tools that Overjix made that if you don't want to launch it with a default way, you can use Overjix's provided tool. Um, yeah, I mean, for sure. We, I, I think it's, I think it's totally fine to have, to have multiple options. I think, I think first, the first, the very first thing we need to do is, is come to a consensus on what the official option is. Make sure that that has all of the things thought through, right? We, we make sure we put all of the different options for running Kubernetes on the board kind, mini cube, micro Kates, whatever the options are, like just put them all up there and pick one and then have one option as the like blessed stable version that we, that, that if somebody doesn't have an opinion, because that's going to be everybody that first arrives, right? When they first show up, they're going to be like, you know what? I don't really care. I don't know enough about this project to have an opinion. I just want something that works. So we gotta, gotta, gotta have an option for them. Yeah. What I'm saying is this, um, Let's not, we don't have to socialize everything. We don't have to bog everything down in bureaucracy. Let's go with what we have because it's almost working. Liver D, we have an, we have an answer for the liver D problem. So go, and it's a one, is vagrant up and it's running, right? And that's what we want the initial experience to be if someone doesn't want to do something else. Um, and then with these other things that we put into this user scripts directory, we can play with those over time. We can experiment with them. And if we want to change, we can do that. But uh, right now, I don't want to change again. Let's, let's go because we, we need, because we need to get pack of pushers and Red Hat on board. So let's just focus on getting what we have to work and document it. And then we can put these other things into a, into user, user tools or user script directory. Yeah. Also uh, to add VirtualBox is adding Intel support on the 6.1 release. It's currently in beta testing. Um, so it's not, production ready, but you mean for nested, for nested virtualization is what you're talking about? 
Yeah, the nested virtualization that um, Derek was telling about issues when running more than two um, mm -hmm. junipers on Intel should go away with the virtual next version of VirtualBox. Of course, I also is it, read is that it feasible, Intel makes it Is it hard. feasible for us to, to pick one hypervisor for everything? Like, is that, is that an option for us? I don't think that's a good idea. We should make it optional, honestly. And Vagrant makes that possible, dude. Okay. Yeah, well, Vagrant we can, say... can run on many hypervisors. The, yeah. the problem is the support. Like Hyper-V hypervisor I was working on because I, I switched from Vagrant or from VirtualBox to Hyper-V um, for all of my work, but there's issues with network interfaces and what's my the, work um, that caused it to not work. Yeah. What What's the experience like if 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 we do support multiple hypervisors and say one hypervisor is appropriate, more appropriate on one system than another? What's the experience like for the user? Like, do they have to? It, do, are we are we then going to have to force everyone to choose at at runtime or? No, I. What I think will happen is this. I think VirtualBox will be the default because as of because this was 16 September that they announced beta for 6.1. So that's the, that's going to come out soon, like probably before the end of the year, if not first quarter next year. Um, the beta runs are a quarter on average for VirtualBox. So it's like three, three or four months. So um, I, I think that VirtualBox 6.1 is going to come out, and we can just say that's the default um, because it'll it'll support virtualization on AMD and Intel, and it's supported on every platform, including macOS. So I think we can say that's the default. And if someone wants to do something else, um, you know, we can have the options inside the Vagrant file, or again, we can have separate user scripts for other hypervisors. I wouldn't lock it down. Yeah, the Vagrant file is easy to adjust to say, if this is the image, do this. If that is the image, do that. Um, but providing the, the standard with VirtualBox, yeah, easy. Like if we moved away from VirtualBox and said libverts, the de facto standard, that eliminates any Windows user. Yeah, I yeah, I I'm okay with when six point one comes out. Um, I, I'm okay with. Uh, I'm I'm okay. With. Yeah, and uh, maybe I, I mean to be honest, maybe if we get to the point where, um, where we have that taken care of, because right now, in the docs, it says basically like you can run the self-medicate script directly if you're running on Linux. In fact, you probably should do that just to bypass that layer of complexity. No, there's stuff you got to do. That's the, with the nun driver, right? Yeah. That, yeah. that doesn't work. It's worked for me. Okay. Yeah. It worked for you, dude. But there's like things you have to do to, to, to the kernel. Like you, especially if you're running the Junus boxes, there's like kernel. Settings oh, that's right. Change. Yeah. No, no, you're right. Sorry. There's yeah, directories you have to make and um, you know, yeah. you have to install CNI manually. So I, it's not, I mean, just as long as it's documented, it's fine, but it's, you know, you have to run as root in order to get that to work, which is yeah. why maybe we don't do that. Maybe, maybe this is what, this is the whole thing with Olivier, right? Let's do it in a container. Yeah, so that's the problem with um, Minikube none is the root issue, uh, which is why a VM is more secure or I, I'm not, I'm not opposed to the kind idea. It doesn't support all versions of Windows, but it does support modern OSs going forward. Um, I don't know how far, how many changes need to be made for kind to support. It doesn't look as generic, like you may have to change directory paths between Windows and Linux. <clears throat> but if we can get kind to work, that may be a, a second option. You know, we support VirtualBox or we support Kind or and we support Kind. I'm okay with my time has been limited the past few weeks. I'm in transition on jobs, uh, but I should have more time 
after hours to experiment with these things to yeah. dedicate to self medicate. Yeah. Okay. So we're talking out all the options and uh, we're running out of time. So what let's, <laughs> let's we'll, we'll do that. You know what? Maybe we should do a, an MP on this or, um, or, or a, a proposal document, but yeah. let's stabilize on what we have, right? Uh, we can assume that virtual box will be the default and then anything outside of the default, which is what we should focus on and stabilize anything outside of that, including kind needs to be a user tools or user script directory and say, Hey, look, these are other tools out here. If you want to experiment with other things, it's not officially supported. You can get a hold of the person that made them. And, um, and then if they get to a point where they're, they're they work reasonably well, then maybe we can back them out into the parent directory. But um, let's focus on getting Vagrant Virtual Box working as a default first, <clears throat> um, because it needs to be stable, guys. We haven't had new content since I did the Bash script, and that was three months ago. And we, and in my experience, <laughs> I told people just just GitHub, just do the Git clone and type in Vagrant up, or or just type in when, when it was the Bash script, and it, it doesn't work. It, like it just didn't work. There was there was issues, so we we have to we have to make that go away, and I, and the way to do that is to standardize. So VirtualBox and and Vagrant. Um, what's next? What's next? It would be. You what? Um. <clears throat> if anyone, um, the other thing is every Friday. I, I mean. I'm only Matt and I are only two people, and we are like we have so much. We have families and and another job besides this, and even though we get to work on this like seventy percent of the time, we have thirty percent other stuff we have to do, including travel, and personal lives, and we are extremely constrained. And we really, and so I've committed to doing this um, to get the curriculum back going every Friday. And I already I already cleared this up my management chain. I do nothing else, no meetings. No other priorities. I just work on adding a single stage to the curriculum on any topic. And um, I, it would be great if I could get someone else to commit to that, uh, to, just to doing one stage a week or one stage every other week. Um, I, I just a stage on anything. It could be anything, YAML, JSON, Python. It doesn't even have to be about networking or, or, or netcom for anything like that. It can just be simple topics. Um, or, or if you know a lot about something like FRR or Batfish or something like that, that's fine. Do a lesson on that. But um, we just one stage a week. I can do one stage a week every Friday. I've clear. I've, I made sure that was possible. Um, uh, and it would. And we're really looking for someone else to do that. And Matt's not going to be the person because um, Matt's list is much longer than mine. And. Uh, and he has a newborn, still this one-year-old kid. So he's still, you know, he <laughs> gets poopy every day when he wakes up. So, uh, <laughs> and so, then I got to worry about my kid. Yeah. Yeah. Then, <laughs> then he's got to take care of his kid. Get it? So if there, if there can be, <laughs> if we get someone to commit to a stage, um, that'd be great. And the thing about doing this simple stages is that you don't have to make an image. You can reuse one of the existing images, a Linux image, let's say. And, um, and so you don't have to worry about that and you can just work on the content and the lessons only got to be the, the lesson should be consumable in 10 minutes or less. That's the goal. Um, it used to be five minutes or less, but um, I don't, it's 10 minutes or less is fine. And it can, like, again, again, it can be about the simplest of topics. You know, it could be at a, at a stage, to the bash lesson, um, at a stage to the YAML lesson. Um, the, right now we have YAML dictionaries and I think, YAML lists, or maybe you have YAML lists and not dictionaries. I don't know, but yeah. you could easily add another YAML lesson or two. Um, anyways, I'm sitting here selling it. Um, if one of you want to volunteer to do a, a stage once a week or once every other week, please respond in the community forums, and um, we can we can um, coordinate. We can have a separate curriculum meeting, like every other week or something, to figure out where people are at and and look at each other's work and and and. Um, and stuff like that if you want, whatever you want to do. But we, we have to get more curriculum. We have to get more stuff into the curriculum. Yeah, I would like to, uh, 
Let me about- get self-medicate stable, and then I would like to start committing curriculum on a monthly basis, at least, maybe semi-monthly, maybe twice a month. Do you do you know PowerShell? Steven? Very little. Ah, we need someone to do some. I don't know anything about it, but it's a lot of people use it out in the wild, and they have libraries I, I and libraries to, of PowerShell it's scripts. Been, it's been years. Yeah. Can, yeah. Can you run it inside a container? Yeah. There's PowerShell's crazy now, dude. PowerShell is like <clears throat> almost yeah, it's good. Ri- it's ridden that Microsoft likes Linux now train. So oh, it's, yeah. like, it's like open source and it's like available on all Linux distros and all that kind of stuff. Is it, is, I don't think, is it called PowerShell anymore? I think there's even an alternate name for it or there was. No, it's still PowerShell to my knowledge. Keep hearing oh, about it. Talk, talk about it was PowerShell. called PowerShell Core for a while. Now it's called, now it's back to being PowerShell. Mm-hmm. Okay, anyways. Um, I threw out, if you want to volunteer for that, please respond. And we'll, like I said, we can have a separate thread, a separate little dialogue going on for that um, because that, it, man, does that need to happen. Um, <clears throat> Matt, I don't know what the next one means. Entry Labs docs split. Yes, that, I was, that was the one I was trying to remember. So one of the things I highlighted, and I actually talked about this in my forum post a little bit, um, the Antidote docs and the NRE Labs curriculum docs are together right now. Um, and we've already talked at length about one of the barriers for people creating new content, which is self-medicate. So I'm not gonna, bring, I'm not gonna talk about that anymore. I think probably a good second choice for a barrier, like the, the barrier after that biggest barrier is probably that the docs aren't easy to follow, which is tough for me to say because I've spent a lot of time on them, but, but I can't deny that they're 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 exhaustive, but they're just hard to follow. And I and I've actually heard that from people, not just me. I've heard that from Red Hat actually. The Red Hat guys were saying like, you know, I don't even know where to like get started in these docs. You can't like read it top to bottom because you can't. That's true. You can't. It actually starts with like Antidote platform docs, which chronologically that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What I would like to suggest is that we split off the the docs that focus on the Entry Labs curriculum and the process for contributing there, as well as getting started with self-medicate, because self-medicate is basically a curriculum resource, um, just because it uses, it does, it's not meant to be used for anything antidote testing wise, it's always using stable releases of that. So my suggestion would be that we, that we split off anything to do with NRE Labs specifically into its own curriculum and that it be rewritten to, um, you know, be effectively chronological, start at the top and then go from step to step to step in, in order to get through the curriculum development experience. I'll also say before it sounds like I'm just inventing things to work on, I would, I would be happy to take this on because I wrote most of the docs anyway. Um, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for me to shove that onto somebody else. My main, my main question is, does that make sense to everybody? Does that sound like a good idea? Uh, I would also say that um, I would probably take the opportunity to move to something like Gitbook instead of read the docs, because Gitbooks look, just looks a lot better. And I think a lot of projects are starting to use that. So I'm just Plus curious. anything with the word Git in it, Matt is automatically on board with it. <laughs> sure. Do you have a pointer for this Gitbook? Uh, no, the pro- well, there's a bunch of projects that use it. Gitbook is kind of like read the docs. It's just, it uses, it uses like, it's just different. It's like a different, different, mm-hmm. um, Okay. different oh i've seen this. but it's yeah this is nice thing. dude like if you look at like the the thing um, i've been doing a lot of prototyping for mp1 and we're going to be using nats as a, as a pub sub messaging system for for antidote um and nats documentation uses it there's actually a lot of projects that start to use it i think it looks a lot better a lot easier to follow than than read the docs if... um we should talk about the docs though i think we should have a tutorial style doc where it walks people through building a fake lesson um yeah. Well, that's kind of what I'm saying, right? Like right now, and then has it's all it's all together. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. It, it it doesn't read like it doesn't read like a story because it really can't. It, I mean, the antidote docs are, will also be part of this because the antidote docs is probably the best place for learning like what kind of things you can put in a lesson. Those that's just like antidote features, so that makes sense to keep there. So there will be references between them, of course, but I think when it comes time to like 
pointing when when it, when we when we're looking to point someone to like go here and and you can learn everything you need to learn about building a lesson just by going to this one site and then that site is is like crucially focused just on that experience and then the antidote uh, docs can then become just purely a reference so just speaking of format what is the source format uh, it is uh... That's another reason. Um, right now, the only place we're using restructured text is yeah. in the uh, is in the is in the docs. If we went to Gitbook, it would it would almost certainly mean that we would be converting all of that to Markdown. Okay, so um, it could even I'm be pro that. Uh, a tutorial, which is a lesson by itself, right? Oh yeah, we can do that too. Yeah, in fact, I think I, I think we should do that too. <laughs> that would be pretty um, dope, actually. And actually, the, all of these, the, I, I know the next topic, actually, in, that I was going to bring up, Maybe because these are, all, these are also kind of related to each other. Um, part of MP1, which, by the way, I, I am officially committing to finishing the draft by the end of this week. And the reason for that is because I have to. And the reason for that is because I'm talking about it at a meetup here in Portland on Thursday. And so expect that. Uh, expect in the next uh, stand up that I'll basically be saying, hey, comments, welcome, ready for review, all that kind of stuff. Hopefully, I'll already have good feedback from a bunch of Go developers here in town. Uh, and, and also, I'll be sending it to a bunch of other folks that I know on the internet. So that'll be cool. Um, circling back to how this impacts the, the initial developer experience, part of what I want to tackle in MP1, which is in the design doc, is uh, we're going to be creating um, brand new models for everything uh, because we're going to be using an external database. And so you need to create, you know, sort of schema. Well, they're ghost structs, but it's kind of the same idea, right? You have to create models for populating that data. And um, when you have that, uh, it becomes a lot easier, especially if you structure it right, which is again, part of the goal of what I'm going to do. Um, it'll be actually a lot easier to, to create, not just import lesson content, but create lesson content. Right now, the only, literally the only way that people can do that is by copying an existing lesson, which is horrible. And I feel guilty about it every single day. Um, I, part of MP1 is, is going to include way, 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 way better command line tooling that says, look, we know what kind of thing go in a lesson because we have the database models built into syringe. Um, and all we gotta do is, is add subcommands to, to SYRCTL. This is like SYRCTL lesson create. And it goes through those models. It, it, it walks you through all those fields and what they do. And it says, how many nodes do you want in this lesson? Three, cool. How do you want them to be connected? This one, this one, this one, cool. What do you want the name of the lesson to be? What do you, and it'll automatically generate the lesson ID. It'll, it'll you know, do all that stuff for you. And I think, honestly, that'll probably get folks 90% of the way there. And they really would only need to run self-medicate to just double check that it's working. And hey, what is a ghost struct? Uh, it's like a, it's like a Python class. It's kind of like you think of it that way. It's an object. Is it, do you actually type the word ghost in? Sorry, not, not ghost, uh, go space struct. It's oh, like a yeah, C, yeah, it's yeah. like a C struct. Yeah, I got you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. And, and so, so, um, that's important. I think, I, like I said, I think a lot of these, a lot of these um, topics do sort of intersect a little bit. Like, would we, we, we wouldn't be so reliant on the on the self medicate experience if our, if the antidote tooling was better. Uh, and if the antidote tooling was better, then we could also build a better, you know, may, maybe we could actually build an NRE Labs lesson that talks about building a, building a lesson. Um, you know, because it's not a, like I said, there's nothing really to show right now. The, the way you create a new lesson is you copy an existing lesson, and that. I'm, you know, we, we can't read a lesson that, that runs the CP command. <laughs> so like all of this, all of these things are related. And I, I think what I, what, the thing I want to underscore is that like, I view antidote 1.0, especially the, the changes to syringe as effectively being able to unlock a lot of these other things. And that's why I'm going to be laser focused on it in the near future. Um, I'll also say, um, uh, you know, I, 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 now that the design is solidifying, it's not actually going to take nearly as long as I thought it would, because again, we're not trying to boil the ocean. We're not trying to do everything. In fact, um, part of what the changes to syringe will be are setting us up for, for better extensibility later. Um, so anyway, oh, also uh, the name syringe is going away. 
<laughs> Sorry to drop that bomb. Um, that's also in the design. Uh, and of course it's all, I mean, I haven't, obviously I haven't like decided anything. I'm, I'm happy to receive feedback on the ideas, but. Um, I think you should open a doc and get everyone's feedback and we'll all vote on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm also interested in like, uh, I'm interested in this like syringe project and I'm looking through like the design and the code base and I'll, I'll probably like raise a PR or something sometime soon. Yeah. So, so just, just to level set, basically what we, what we've been doing over the past few weeks a few months actually is thinking about, um, the, 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 the backend platform for all of this, we call it antidote. And that's kind of what I want to refer to everything as going forward. Um, right now the design is, is still very much in the proof of concept stage. We built it to be very, very simple at the beginning. So we could like work out the rest of the project, which right. I think we succeeded in doing. Um, so what we're doing now is we're, we're going back to the drawing board and say, okay, we kind of know how everything else has to work. How can we best, how can we best redesign the antidote to, to work properly in that environment? And so that's what we're doing now. Um, so I, if you, if you want to get more involved on the, on that portion of the project, which is currently called syringe, but we'll just be calling it antidote going forward. Right. Um, I, I would love that. I would absolutely love that. The, cool. the best way I think, the best way I think for you to do that is, take a peek at the design um, when I, you know, basically I'll send a notification out on the forums and I'll probably talk about it in, tomorrow, in next week's stand up and say, yep, the, right. des the design draft is, is finished and it's ready for review. So just go through that and ask questions and, and uh, raise concerns and do whatever you need to do. Cool. Um, yeah, because this is, this, is, this is kind of probably going to be the last time that such a dramatic change is made to that layer. So if you want to get involved, now is like the perfect time because you'll get in at the ground floor. Cool, cool, thanks. Yeah. Okay. What's your, what's your background, by the way? I'm just curious. Uh, um, I, I haven't done that much Go, but uh, I did C and C plus plus, and but I um I'm picking up Go and yeah. Yeah. I, perfect. I, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. You can kind of think of Go as like an easier C. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It's nice like that. Okay. Um. Let's, uh, <clears throat> so we talked MP1, uh, and we, we talked the opportunities for improvement. Um, we talked docs. Um, I have an, I do have an item I forgot, and this is, and then we got to go. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're six over. Uh, we're six over, but <clears throat> um, we have a live stream that we do every other week, and we don't get live viewers um most weeks we get zero and some weeks we might get two uh we get yeah i know you do olivier <laughs> but sometimes you're not even there right yeah, so it's the time olivier and, uh, what gives why can't you be there every single time uh i i have to go back home <laughs> yeah so we have um i actually by the way uh when this meeting started there was light coming through the window behind olivier and look at it it's dark now um the uh, so we we don't get a lot of viewers at the current time slot, and also three. I I put some time and effort into curating a list of guests that I thought would be interesting. People on the vendor side, people who are like sort of visionary and, and outspoken about network automation and have like future thinking ideas and stuff like that, but mixed with people who are actually doing network automation in production, and it has given me a great deal of heartburn that um, three out of the four last guests could not make the time that they agreed to. And they usually don't tell me until the night before or f the Friday before. And that I really, we can't do this anymore. And Monday at noon is maybe not the best time. Um, not enough viewers. And for some reason people, when Monday, like Monday is when I guess you go into work and all this shit happens, right? And then it's <laughs> progressively throughout the rest of the week that, um, you know, there's, you have open time slots. So I'm, what I'm proposing is that we move the live stream um, to Wednesday or Thursday, um, like in the afternoon. I, I, I that's my proposal. Um, and when I say proposal, I mean, if nobody objects to it, it's going to happen because we cannot keep doing this. Um, do, you, do you really need to have a, a fixed schedule? I mean, uh, being live 
in the sense of people interacting or because it seems to me that it, it was basically something that was many like recorded and uh, no interaction with uh, potential viewers. Maybe because there were none, but... Uh... Yeah, well, the original intent was to have it consistently at the same time so that we could have like a live show, right? And that we could yeah, have like people but... that are like, you know, asking questions live and that was the idea. Uh, we're just not getting the live engagement. We're getting a lot of engagement though on the recordings. Like that's the thing, there's a mismatch there. Yeah, people are watching the recordings. So people want to watch the content. The problem is that they're not watching it at Monday at noon. And the more I think that, the more I say that out loud, the more it, it's kind of insane that we picked the time that we did. So we, we need like Wednesday and like, they'll tell you the best time to tweets are like, to, if you want to get your tweet out into the universe is um, Wednesday and Thursday, you know, during the, during the morning or the afternoon. And um, because that's when people have the most time during the week is on those two days. And uh, that's when people are getting tired of work. So they are on the net looking at things. So I'm proposing that we move it to Wednesday or Thursday. I, I'm, I'd like to do even Thursday, um, to, be, to be totally honest, like Thursday one in the afternoon or something, because people will get back from lunch and they don't feel like working because they've been there all week and they're sitting at their desk and they might click in. Exact. Well, yeah, I get that. Um, but I, for those of you who can see Olivia's video, he made a point without words. He, he showed somebody dozing off because somebody, people might fall asleep at one o'clock, but also um, that's, that's true. But, you know, we also want to do it at a time when people, because we have people in the UK and, and in France who want to watch, who want to watch the stream. So we doing it first thing in the morning doesn't make sense. I don't think um, because Anyways, we're going to move it to Wednesday or Thursday afternoon. Does anyone have any objections or any thoughts on whether it should be Wednesday or Thursday? And by the way, we're not opposed to pre-recording it, um, but it'll still come out on the same time and the same day. It'll just be a recording. Nothing? Oh, by the way, I think uh, we should have more recordings of the presentations. Like, uh, it's too bad that uh, Matt's conference at OSS wasn't recorded. Mm, yeah. Because sometimes well, I think it's more useful to the project also uh, yeah. than just having a conversation between networking experts uh, that more or less are redundant between different guests. Yeah. I agree. Yep. As it as I can, I will say that like this, like for my talk this Thursday, I'm gonna I'm gonna re-record that. So if it makes sense for me to re-record, then I'll do that. I you know, there's not much we can do about like what you kind of the second part of what you said, which is like if the conference doesn't yeah. offer recording, they may also not want to be recorded. Um, so that conversation that's valuable yeah. that takes place in the room may not may not be possible. But at the very like I said, at the very least, the content of the presentation I can personally say like I'll, I'll make the time to, to do a to do a proper recording after I give the talk and that way everybody sees it hmm. yep right. and we have and we have a playlist to find on our channel if you go there we have um, instructional videos and what we call NRE in the wild and NRE in the wild is where such a video would, would go um, okay so without any feedback or thoughts immediately I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna schedule that um, move the live stream to Thursdays at one in the afternoon. Uh, just because, <laughs> it's, you know, and I'm, that's really the best time. Is that central? One central, correct. It's okay. noon my time, sorry. And it's right now it's one Eastern. Um, I don't know, so maybe we keep it noon, Thursday noon central, that'd be one Eastern. Um, 10 a.m. Okay, so one, one Eastern, got it. Yeah, one Eastern. So Thursday, one Eastern is okay. when we're going to move it. I'll make the announcement on Twitter and in the community forums, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Um, Matt and I, uh, I by the way, um, we're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discuss this without talking to Matt first, but uh, we do have, I, we, I have some thoughts and more shows that Matt and I can do. Um, we, that, Network automation certification show went pretty well. People liked it, the feedback I got. 
And we have other, I, I have other ideas anyways for, for shows like that where we kind of explore a topic and we pull resources from the internet and we talk about it and, and just have commentary. Um, so I think we'll, you'll see a couple, some more of that um, probably, probably in the next two months in particular because it's hard to book people during December and January. <laughs> so um, be ready, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Uh, uh, including a show called, uh, hopefully a regular show, we'll do maybe once a month called um, Things I Wish I Knew About Automation and Networking. And then we should also do a show called Things I Wish I Didn't Know. Oh, yeah, yes. Well, we can divide it. We can do half and half. Um, <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, with that. Uh, yeah. Quick question. So um, do we have like two meetings, live stream and then a different one or just like one? I'm kind of lost. This is the only meeting that, um, that you're on unless we do set up a separate meeting to talk about curriculum stuff, which, which I'm, we so desperately need to start developing and, and getting a, like a, a community going around content development that we, that we might end up with a second meeting. But right now, this is the only meeting. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, the live you, stream, you can think. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Derek. Yeah, I'm really caffeinated. Stream, it's just a, it's just a show. It's just, okay. you can you, you can drink coffee and half pay attention and and it's just me and Matt acting like jackasses and talking about automation and networking. Okay. Okay. Do you cool. want to be on that show? Uh, no, I was just wanted. I just I did. I I, I wasn't sure there was like two or one or I wasn't sure. Yeah, but yeah, thanks. Okay. Cool. Uh, that's it. All right. Thanks for staying late, everybody. We'll, uh, we'll wrap this up and then we'll talk to you next week. Take care. See you later, Olivier. Thanks for joining, Giannis. Bye.